Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay up the back? Yep, cool. Okay. Hands up here who owns or runs their own business? Good, you're in the right place. Okay. Um, these slides are the opposite of Tony's. I put a lot of information in my slides, um, so sorry about that, but um, all the links will be available um, when the, the guys post them up to the, the website. Um, what I've tried to do is take my two-day mastermind course and shrink it down into 30 minutes. So I'm going to talk quite fast and go through quite a lot of slides. But just bear in mind all the information is in there and all the links are in there. You can look at that later on. Um, and we'll try and do questions at the end. Um, so let's get straight into it. Um, we're all in it for the money, if we've got our own businesses. Um, we want to make money, we want to have a good life, we want to be able to be the good dad, the good mum, spend some time, quality time with that as well. Um, so in able to get money, um, well, we need customers, yep. Yeah? And where do we get customers from? They don't just fall from the sky. Um, so we need to get leads. Um, so this first part of this is just about how, how do we get those leads coming in so we can generate them to, to customers and clients. So what I see when I work with businesses and services is time and time again, um, I see the same thing on the websites. And that is um, they're just telling everyone what they do and what services they offer. So if they're a service based, you'll look at some of these websites. So we do web design, we do graphic design, we do content marketing um, for products. Um, simply, here's the products we do. Here's a beauty product, here's the shoes. And that's great. We need things to sell because we need things to sell to people to make money, because that's what it's all about. Okay? And that's great. There are people out there who are buying right now from you, and that's fantastic. However, the market size for the people who are buying from you right now is very, very, very small. Okay? So here's a question to ask yourself. When was the last time you bought something for absolutely no reason at all? I'm sure some has done that, but it's generally when people buy stuff, they're buying things because they, they have a problem they need to solve right now or in the foreseeable future. When they're buying something, what they're doing is they're moving themselves from one state to another, from being unhappy to being happy. If you're buying an umbrella, you're moving yourself from being wet to dry. So if there's one key point from this whole talk that I'd like you guys to take away, is that people engage your business at different levels of problem awareness. Okay. So you can't really sell to everyone and expect them to be in, I need this right now, I'm in buy now mode right now. Well, you can, but you're not gonna make serious money doing that. So has this ever happened to you? You're on LinkedIn, you get a connection request, you have a look at the person, you think, yep, that's fine. I'd like to expand my, uh, my LinkedIn network. I'm quite happy, I'll accept you. And then an hour later, a day later, we provide development, content marketing, web services, blah, 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 hire us now, bye, 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 money, money, money. <sighs> that is just the wrong conversation for you to have at that particular time. It's like, hi, I'm Will, nice to meet you. Do you want to get married? Boom. It's just the, the wrong way. I'm not in buy mode at that particular time. Okay? So let's have a look at the entire audience overview. Imagine them like a pyramid. So the top 3% of your potential clients are in buy now mode. They know there's a problem. They know that there's a solution out there. They know that you provide the solution and it looks quite attractive. So you know, they, they're really um, going to buy from you. There's a 17% who are in information gathering mode. They know that there's a problem out there and they know that there's solutions there and they're looking for what solution they want to buy. Under that is 20%. Um, they are problem aware, but they're not really too sure what solutions are out there and they just started the search in that. And at the bottom of the pyramid, there's a whopping 6% of people who are clueless. They don't even know they have a problem. Right. So the goal is to move that 97% up to the 3% at the top of the triangle. So how do we go about doing that? Well, there's a problem first, is what I see for businesses. And it's what I call the only the top 3% problem. Now, these top 3% are great, and that's, and that's where you're gonna make a lot of money from, because they are ready to purchase your stuff right now. The problem is that all your competitors are also after that 
because it's easy, right? They're in buy mode, they're going to buy stuff. What that means is that that 3% is being stretched across all your competition. So you're going to make some money, but you're not going to make great money. Does that make sense? Now, in these mastermind courses, I get asked a lot about niching. Should you do a niche, should you not do a niche? And people get very hung up on this. Personally, I don't think you need to niche, and I'll tell you why in the next couple of slides. Um, but if you do want a niche, and some people find it important, um, we do a little workshop with people. And here's five stages, five steps that you can do to try and define your niche. The first step is you basically create two circles. One is your passion, things that you really, really like doing. And the other one is the skills, the things that you're really, really good at. Sometimes they don't always work together, but you should find that something in the middle um, is an area where you're good at and you like to do. And that should be, um, give you some definitions for maybe particular niches that you want to try and research. The second part you want to do is to see if there's an actual market there to sell to. There's no point in just plucking something if there's no market. So you can do that in Google Keyword Planner um, as a tool that you can use. Um, it tells you how many people are searching for particular keywords and long key tail um, phrases. So go and have a look at the, the areas that you've identified between those circles. And just go and have a look and see if there are people actually searching for those terms. What you'll tend to find is if there's no searches, then either one, you've hit the gold mine, which is great, or secondly, there's just no market out there. So it's kind of pointless going after putting your effort into that. Um, conversely, you could find that you get millions of search results back. Um, so if you're finding either of those um, places, then you, you probably need to have a look at your niche and maybe redefine that. Either make it smaller or do that research in step one again, until you find a good market size that you can really sell to. So step four, um, obviously you need to sell something, so you need to find some problems in, within that niche. To have a look at some of those problems, then you want to start hitting all the, the social net groups. So Instagram, forums, and Facebook pages, and, and groups, and um, Reddit as well. A lot of people post on Reddit. Um, you want to be listening to what people are whining about. What problems do they have? See if you can then create a solution around that and then sell that to them. Step five, once you've gone to, to that length, is um, you need to have a look to see what competitors are in the market. Um, and just a simple way to do that is a simple Google search. So do a Google search for your keywords that you put in the keyword planner and your market. Um, and have a look at the PPC ads. That's the Google paid ads. That's the ones that appear at the top. Um, if there's a load of those, then um, that's probably not a good market to go after because it's already swamped. These people are paying good money, a lot of money, to try and target that market audience. So you're really looking for a good balance in between all that. So it can be quite difficult to find a niche, and it can be quite time consuming. But if you want to do it, then those are the five basic steps that you can try. So let's look at where your potential clients are. Let's imagine that pyramid again. Um, yes, the 3% at the top um, are in buy mode, um, but there's real good money to be had in that 37% of people who are problem aware. They're not quite in buy now mode, but let's look at pushing them up the pyramid. There is, however, a fantastic opportunity for that 60% at the bottom. So bear that in mind. And I guarantee you that a lot of your competitors will be completely ignoring them. And the reason is it's hard work to get those up to the top into buy mode. But it can be done, and the rewards can be huge. That's 60% of that market that you're going for. So let's look at targeting that 37%. We're talking about landing pages here. Okay. We're, what we want to do is highlight problems, um, one problem per landing page, and then have a look at the associated pain points around that particular problem. You want to highlight associate issues. You want to describe all the pain points, and then, of course, you want to set out a solution, your solution that they can buy. You want to show that you can solve those pain points, um, and you want to redress all the objections for them buying as well. So let's look at um, an example. So, yep. So, niche is not required. That's why I think a niche is not required, because these are like general, general targets that you can use for anyone um, to create a landing page to target a particular market. So, you don't have to niche. As long as you can do these things, then you can target pretty much anyone. So, here's an example. Embarrassed of your yellow and stained teeth. I drink a lot of tea, my teeth are pretty yellow. Um, so, this could be like a problem solution. Just imagine this. 
Are you scared to smile in public? Missed out on socialising with friends, being let down by other products. They're fairly common associative problems with that main one. Well, here, you know, whiten your teeth in three easy steps at home. Shine your smile confidently in public. Notice the copy, it's positive words. It's uplifting words. Okay? We're redressing some of the, the issues. So you've been scared to smile in public and now you're confident in public. Become a pack leader and envy of all your friends. So you've, been, you've went from missing out on social with friends to being a pack leader, fantastic. Brilliant white teeth, 100% happy customers. You're addressing that issue of being let down by other products. So can you see how we're highlighting the main issue, some of the problems around it, and then being able to redress that with your solution. So here's the hard sell. Buy today and get an additional month's supply, completely free, one-time offer. We're bringing in some urgency here to encourage people to, to buy. One easy payment, $79, get the payment out of the way. Ship free to your door, two to three working days, so we can see how it's easy to get. Um, video how-to guide showing you how it works. All natural ingredients and environmentally safe. Environment's quite big for people, so include that in your landing pages. We're trying to encourage people, we're trying to build trust to bring these people back up that pyramid scale. Quick 60-minute hassle-free treatment, showing you how long it's going to take. Um, each treatment lasts up to one week. How much are we getting for that? Super easy treatments last a month, and here's how we pay. Pay by PayPal, card, online, or over the phone. Convenience in how to pay. So if you can imagine those landing pages, we're trying to encourage those people that they can overcome their issues, their problems with our solution. So we can do pretty much the same for the 60%, the huge market. Now these, problem, these people don't know that there's a problem there. So we have to step up a little bit. We can't just target them with normal landing pages like the one before. We need to actually tell them and let them know, make them aware that there is a problem so that we can then push them up using the previous landing pages. So we can do this with example articles. Um, so did you know that one in three men in their 20s have naturally occurring stained teeth? It's not a true fact, I just put that there. Um, but can you see that article is actually targeting people? It's targeting men in their 20s with an article. New breakthrough home treatment, banishes dirty stained teeth for good. Okay. Again, it's just highlighting that problem. Dirty stained teeth, oh yeah, that could be me. Um, here's a good one. Research shows, and this is not true, I just made up. Research shows that a brighter smile closes more business deals. <laughs> Again, it's targeting people in business. It's targeting people who don't know they've got a problem, but wouldn't you be a little bit interested in, in how a brighter smile could increase your business? You might be clicking on that to go through and then go, yeah, okay, that, that could be an issue. I, I, I want to close more deals. And just general ones. Um, can stained teeth be whitened or can yellow stained teeth be, uh, be removed? So again, the, these are just examples of how we take that bottom half that don't understand they have a problem and just try and make them problem aware. So kind of engage in them and try slowly to move them up that pyramid. So here's the general strategy and very general to get leads. We need to find a problem that exists that could be in a niche or not a niche. You need to understand all the related pain points, or at least enough pain points around there to be able to, for people to empathize and understand, yet yeah, that, that puts me in that situation. I understand that, that's who I am. Of course, you have to have a solution that fixes that problem, that's what we're trying to sell. We need to redress the pain points to show them that our solution does um, solve all those pain points. Redress, redress objections to buying, to commit. So is it easy? Is it affordable? Do you trust me? All that. Um, and then building your landing pages for those particular um, problem aware types. So I don't want to go into landing page design, um, but I did do a talk at the WordPress meetup about that. So there's a link in the slides. You can go and watch the video. It's about an hour long and it goes through the different design elements of your uh, landing pages um, and the copy, positive copy, good images, stuff like that. And just bear in mind if you do your landing pages, um, there's these five basic obstacles that you're trying to get over in a general landing page. So that's nobody ha somebody has no need for it, that's your 60%. They don't have money or they don't have the, the price point that you're offering. Um, it's not of urgency to them. Um, they have no desire in your solution 
Um, and they've certainly got no trust because they don't know who you are or anything to back up. So those are the generally five points you want to try and overcome in, in a landing page. OK, so I've done all this work. Let's see if we can try qualifying these leads on the landing pages. So when you're generating your landing pages, uh, try and avoid these types of questions on them. So try to avoid open-ended questions and have specific ones. So answer yes, no, um, numbers, um, one, two, three. Um, don't have open-ended questions. Don't have hard questions. So when you're asking stuff on, on landing pages, it's not an exam. Don't make them think too hard. We want to make this really easy for people to go through landing page um, and get to what you want them to do. And don't bang them with too many options. You know, are you a social person? Are you not a social person? Do you network too much? And blah, blah, blah. People go, what? Just give them three options. One, two, three. Make it nice and easy for them. So here's some good stuff that you can put on landing pages. Use a personal story. So how can learning a new language help you? Oh, well, Ingrid learned Spanish, you know, and she was um, able to create a business course from that. And she's moved into this new area. She's um, living her life better because she, she uh, learned a new language from this service that we provide. So get personal. Tell about how your product, your solution helped people. And make it hard to say no when they're on the landing page. So here's an example. Would you like to subscribe to this online course for a one-time only 88% discount? Close this page and you lose this massive saving forever. Oh, I must buy now. Define target audiences. If you have a social product, if you're selling a social solution, you don't want people who are not in the social area to buy it, so qualify them. Are you new to social media? So if you've got a package that's targeting new people, you want to make sure that you're getting the right people on your landing pages. So ask those questions. And use first-person questions as well, because people can empathize with those. How can I overcome my fear of public speaking? Yep, that's me. So people can really empathize with first-person questions. So I go through um, quite a lot of the psychology of this. I've got a, another blog post on that, because it's a huge topic on itself. So you can read that after the talk. So when, people, when you do landing pages, people are not just going to give you all their information okay, and for nothing. So the idea here is you've got to have something to offer them, something in exchange to give the, for them to give you their information. We tend to call this a high value content offer. And this is generally for the 37%, so people who are problem aware um, and people who are looking for the solution. And what you want to do is off, give them something that's really, really valuable, not just a general ebook or like a, 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 say a document, something that is real value to them. So here's an example of a client um, I worked with in the early part of this year. Um, they had a videography service. So we did a landing page. It was something similar along this line. Download my entire elite video production step process, the one I use on every professional video I create, honed from over 5,000 professional hours. A document, five how-to videos, nothing left out. Become your own video agency. I mean, that's really just throwing everything at them. Wow. And that, that just, it was completely different to what the competition were doing. Competition were, were um, selling a couple of videos, and they might have a, a little one-page tick list on what to do. These guys were throwing the entire process out for free. Okay? Now, yes, you'll get people who will just take, and you won't get stuff back. But I guarantee you, you're going to build trust, and you're going to build engagement by giving people what, what you do. People will see value in that, and they'll also see value that buying your time um, is be beneficial for them because they don't have to spend all that time themselves. They are now saying that, well, if you've done all this stuff, you're the expert. Yeah, OK. I'm happy to buy your services. And it really does work. High value content offer. So here's what we do. In our landing pages, we drive the high value content offer. Um, and we want to book what I call an introduction session. I say 17 minute, but just keep it short. In that introduction session, we want to find their specific pain points, and then we want to tailor our solutions so they bring them into buy mode. When we're doing these uh, sessions, we want to make it quick. So do your intros really, really quickly. Um, I tend to say four minutes um, for the intros, and get it over and done with, and then bang, take control of that session. So in this introduction session, we're going to find out a little bit more about each other. Let's begin. 
and there's some essentials that you need to cover when you're doing these introduction sessions. So you want to look at target audiences um, and main competitors. You want to have a look at budget and time frame. Okay, can they afford your service and can you do it in time? Why do you need this done? That's the biggest question that you need to ask. Why? Um, and what are the biggest pain points right now? Okay, what, what can you quickly um, sell them that's going to make their life a lot better? And get them to tell you what it's going to look like when you've delivered that service as well. Uh, and very importantly is uh, what have you tried before, what's worked and, and what's failed? You don't want to do the same thing that's not worked for them before. Now, introduction uh, sessions are very different from discovery sessions. Um, introduction sessions are quick. You need to find the main pain points and push them into buy mode. Generally, discovery sessions are a lot deeper. People are usually already in buy mode at the top of the pyramid, um, and they're a lot longer. They last for two hours, four hours, or a half day, um, and it's a really deep dive into that business. Um, and again, why do you need this? So some Quick things on to cover for a, a discovery session if you want to do that. Um, so again, the same essentials for introductory, but you want to do the deep dive. You want to find out things like customer lifetime value, how much it costs for when they get a lead, um, the business goals, um, what's underperforming the business areas, and you want to do why, 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 why all the time. So that's why discovery sessions can last for at least half a day, because you're asking these clients the same question. Why do you want to do that? Why does this make sense? Where do you want to go from here? So again, more details in the blog post there for you. OK, we, we are getting there. OK, so ads. So all this stuff before has been like um, a, uh, uh, just general, general people going to your, your site. But what we should do is targeting these landing pages with ads as well. So let's look at the different type of ads to drive people to your, your websites. And so when you use Google Ads, use Google Ads, they obviously appear in searches. These people are already looking for solutions. They're already problem aware. So you use Google Ads to target the top three and the top 17% towards the, into that buy mode. Facebook Ads um, are generally uh, people on social networks. They're generally not um, particularly aware that there's a problem. Um, so you can use those to really get that 60% um, and that 20% and push them up to the pyramid as well. OK, let's, we've done all this hard work. Let's have a look at proposing. Okay. So pricing, um, cost-based pricing versus value-based pricing. Um, cost-based pricing is the time it takes for you to do your stuff. Um, so example, hourly rates. So there's an example that all people start off with. Five-page website, takes you five hours, charge uh, 750. Or for e-commerce, you know, it's a little bit more. It's going to be 40 hours. That's $6,000. But it doesn't really scale. Just so you get a big client in that's got all that stuff up there, are you, it's going to take you 200 hours. Are you going to charge them $30,000? You can do, but if you're just pumping out an, an equation numbers, then they're not going to see the ROI back in that. If you just say, oh, it's going to cost you 30,000, the client cannot see the value in that, and they'll just, you won't get anywhere in that. And that's why value-based pricing is the best model. So when we're doing value-based pricing, what we're basically doing is the, um, we're selling a service based on the client's perception of their return of investment. It's not your time. It does require a discovery session to be done because you need to find out about their business. You need to find out about their pain points and um, their objections and the customer lifetime value, their target audience. You need all this stuff to be able to do value-based pricing to tell them what they're going to get back in return. So why is it so much better? Well, it delivers a solution that the client actually needs because you've done the discovery session. You know what they need now. And it has the best chance of making you money over the cost-based value. The client can perceive how much investment cost um, versus ROI. And it completely decouples your time against um, what you're delivering in your solution. So let's look at the proposal essentials. So some things to include, well, after you've done the discovery session, after you're now pitching mode, you're writing your proposal. You definitely want to include your terms and conditions, how you're working with them. Um, the requirements, what's in scope and what's out of scope. Very important, what's out of scope. The workflow, how are you going to work with them? The deliverables and milestones, what are you going to deliver? What's the major things that you're going to deliver? Cost breakdown, how much is each component in that cost? Because that can then justify the end price if people are looking to see, oh, well, that bit costs that, that bit costs this, that is why it costs this much at the bottom. 
the schedule. When are you going to deliver all this stuff? And the total investment, we call it, we call it investment rather than cost, because cost is kind of money that you just threw out, whereas investment is something you're earning. So total investment that they're going to pay and the payment schedule. Get a signature. Please don't rely on verbal stuff. Okay? Get that client to sign it off. Okay? So I've included a link um, to the template that I use, the proposal template that I use. So please download that. Um, have a look, plug in your numbers, rebrand it, but it'll give you a star for 10, um, covering all those different essentials there. Getting paid. Um, there's different ways of getting paid. Um, all up front is kind of unusual. Um, more usual is a deposit now and some more later. Um, my terms are 50% now as a deposit and then 50% on agreed deliverables done. Now, notice I've said agreed deliverables and not project end. Because if you're working with the larger customers, when you're delivering stuff, that project will roll on and on and on. So basically, when you've done your stuff, when you've delivered, it's like, I've done my stuff, I've given it to you, now give me your money, okay? rather than project completion. Um, some other ones up there, 25% deposit, you can do on a month by month or on a milestone basis, totally up to you. But in generally, deposit now and more later tends to work. Have a clear payment time frame. Um, ask your clients when you're, before you're pitching them, when is their payroll? There's no point saying, oh, here's the payment I expect in seven days if their company is doing a payroll run every 28 days or the first of the month or the last of the month. You know, just ask them. It's a simple question. It avoids embarrassment. Please do issue invoices. I've worked with businesses who um, their clients have, have called them and say, oh, where's the invoice for this work? Don't embarrass yourself. Send out the invoice. Make sure that's there. If your software has invoice reminders, turn it on. Everyone's busy. Um, sometimes people miss invoices. But having that reminder that sends out um, is great. Okay, so definitely turn that on if your software supports that. And again, if after all that, you're still not getting paid. Remember, we signed the document, the client signed the document. That's legal contract. So if you have got any issues, then you can start that legal process to try and recoup your money. And that's why it's so important to get your customer to sign that document, because it makes it legally binding. And of course, if they want to give you cash, that's fine, we accept cash. Um, so that's the end of my talk. It's, it's a huge amount of stuff, and I've tried to elaborate a little bit more with some um, blog posts that you can read afterwards to try and get a little bit more information. Um, yeah, but hopefully that's ho helped you a little bit on your journey understanding a little bit more about value-based costing as opposed to just cost-based pricing. Um, so definitely try and give it a go. Um, try and engage your audiences, the different um, problem awareness, and try and drive them up. Um, and try to do some discovery sessions. Try and talk to your clients and find out about all their pain points and get them to tell you how to write your proposal for them. So thanks very much, and I'll ask any questions. Okay, we, we have time for two questions. Has anybody got some questions for Will? Yeah, we've got to have a, with no mic, Ronna. I, I'm conscious we've also got the, um, the live stream, so we need the mic. Do you want to pass across to you? Hi, Vlad. Good to see you again, mate. Thanks, you um, Yes, um, I've had some clients that have been very resistant to value-based pricing. That is, there are some people out there just seem to be very determined to work out what they think your labour costs are to do something and then try and, you know, say, well, I could do the same thing if I get this developing country workforce. And at the moment I just say, well, you know, like, I don't, you know, that's not how we work, you know, and yep. we think we've had people who have been disappointed in that and that's why they come to me. But do you have any other tactics for dealing with people who just don't want to pay based on value rather than what they instead what they think your costs are? Yeah, I generally, that's a great question. Um, I generally find this for working with older clients, so people who have been in business for a long, long time. Um, it's a difficult conversation to have with them, um, but essentially in, in the proposal um, that I've got a template link there, the components that you're selling them for the solution are, are broken down in a cost by cost factor. So things like um, creating a website, uh, creating a moving it over to a development server, testing on the development server, testing against milestone one, delivering graphics, doing content, uploading media, doing SEO, 
doing your first marketing, social media, they're all different components within that proposal and they're all priced accordingly. So even though at the end, there's a huge number that you're justifying as a value based, within that proposal, they can see a breakdown of those costs within them. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, I guess. So you can try, try doing it that way. Thank you. Thanks, Vlad. Okay, we have another question. Hi, I was just looking at the uh, example you had before with the video company um, where they their idea was to give their process away for free. Yeah. Um, I'm a marketer as well and I, I totally understand that, but I think maybe if you could give some more clarity um, for um, us as maybe web, website, WordPress developers, if we did our you know 100 point checklist that we all go through to you know, get ready to launch a website. Um, that is going to be super, super valuable for everyone in this room who's also a WordPress developer, but maybe not to the ideal client. So um, even though it might be an authority piece of information that you're kind of providing, it may not be, you know, information that they're willing to consume or able to consume. So is there another, like, example you could use or, or are you, you, like, I'm just wondering that specific example, because they're obviously offering that video production as a service. Um, they're, they're, I feel like there's a little bit of a mismatch between the message and the target audience. Yeah, so this is all about defining that's your target audience, and you're right. So that high value content offer, that was targeting that 37% of people who are problem aware. Um, and it was a, a great deal. And the reason that we did that whole inclusive stuff was because they had a huge amount of competition out there. So um, a lot of their competition were selling or, or were producing a lot of high value content or what precedes high value content. We needed to go a step further, okay? So we were not trying to compete with them on the same level. We wanted to actually blow the socks off the competition. So we went that one, that one step further to say, we'll do the same as your competition, but we'll just give you the whole works. And yeah, you, you're right. Some people were just overblown with that. Some people, they got emails back to say, is this real? <laughs> Are we getting access to your entire stuff? And all we need to give you is like our email address. And we we're like, yeah, yeah, that's totally true. So it works for the majority of people. And there are some people that will come back and won't understand or won't perceive the value of that. But that's, that's the way that marketing works. I mean, you know it yourself. So it's all about targeting that high value content for that specific, I'm not gonna say niche, but that specific kind of target audience that you wanna go for. Thanks for the question, that's good. Well, I'm conscious of time, and I do know that we'll, again, we'll be around during the lunch break, um, so please feel free to ask him lots of questions. Uh, he'll also be, obviously, at the WordCamp down in Sydney later on this year. So I'd like you to thank, again, thank Will for his um, <laughs> really cool ideas. <laughs>